episode of Jay Leno's Garage. People seem to like it when I do my own cars, and this is one of my favorites. This is a 1957 Corvette. Uh, this is a very special car because it was ordered uh, in 1957 by a young GI who was stationed in Korea. He went to, uh, I guess, the base and ordered this directly uh, from Korea, so it would be waiting for him when he got home. And he wanted the fastest, most powerful, lightest Corvette he could get. So he got the soft top deleted, there's no heater, there's no radio, there's no courtesy lights, there's nothing on this car that would have added any weight at all. He ordered the 283 engine with the two four barrel carburetors and the four speed uh, transmission. You know, a bit of Corvette history, when they came out in 53, it had that blue flame six, which was about 155 horsepower, and it had the automatic transmission, eh, not real impressive. 55, they come out with the 265 V8. Then in 56, they got a little bit more serious. I think 57, at least by my way of thinking, was the first year they said, all right, we're gonna go racing here. Because the only competitor was the Ford Thunderbird, but that was more of a personal luxury car. That had a 312 V8, and most of those uh, came with an automatic, weren't too many. They usually had a three-speed with an overdrive, and they weren't real sports cars. They were personal luxury cars, whereas this was a true sports car. Arcus Duntoff, of course, the genius behind Corvette. This is his baby. This is when he really got serious. Most Corvettes came standard with a manual transmission, which was the three-speed. The four-speed was optional. The gentleman that ordered this, he wanted the 283, 270 horse with the 411 gears. He wanted it to be the fastest thing on the road. He ordered a hard top, but no soft top because he didn't want all the mechanical stuff, you know, all the, I don't know how many pounds I could add, just a few, but he was serious about racing it. And it really is quite a fast car. And to me, one of the best looking Corvettes of all time. Uh, I think this is just classic pure design. The later Corvettes, 58 was a big year for Chrome at General Motors. They put that big toothy grill on the Corvette. They went to dual headlights. Most of the GM cars in 58 had massive amounts of Chrome, Oldsmobile and Buick. This to me is the most European and the cleanest and the purest design. He ordered this in this Inca silver was the color. I believe only 65 cars that year were painted this color. And with the orange, uh, it doesn't sound like it would be appealing when you're looking at the order sheet, but the guy must have had a pretty good eye because I think it's really attractive, the orange and the silver. Uh, the only thing not stock on this car uh, right now are these mag wheels and, of course, the tires. This car was restored by Mike McCluskey. Uh, he's our uh, Corvette restorer extraordinaire. He's the gentleman that went through my 63 split window and made it all proper. This was his baby. Everything here is 1957 from the uh, windshield to the generator to every part of it. This is exactly as it left the factory, once again with the exception of the mag wheels. A drum brakes all around, solid axle car of course, but a real sports car. You know, in 57, it was the first year of the uh, fuel injection and the young soldier who ordered this could have gotten the fuel injection, but fuel injection at that point was uh, people, what fuel injection? The only other fuel injected car in the market really was the Mercedes uh, 300 SL. That was the first production fuel injected car. And it just seemed way too complicated. Although the fuel injected car had 283 horsepower, horsepower for every cubic inch, that was pretty good. This with the two four barrels is what most people knew and understood. In fact, Quite a number of people that ordered the fuel injection as late as 63 eventually went back and just had it converted to two, two four barrels because the hot rodders didn't really like to work with the fuel injection. They had to be really good. People knew carburetors and two four barrels are pretty impressive when you open the hood. When you open the hood, you look at the Rochester fuel injection. What, what does that do? What does that do? But two four barrels, everybody knows what that means. In fact, let's take a look at the engine right now. Let me come around here. Let me get on the other side. When you open these hoods, you always want to open it from the center so you don't damage the hinges. There we go. 
Now, as you can see, this compartment, engine compartment, is not pristine because this is a working driving car. We use this one a lot. There's your two four barrels. The only thing not stock is this has a, f a clutch on the fan that disengages the fan above 15 or 20 miles an hour. And of course, it has a modern battery because we drive this thing. Something unusual to notice that tachometer is driven off the generator. A two to one ratio. And of course, these pie plate air clean. These look like something that would have come from J.C. Whitney. You know, you put it on afterwards as an accessory. Normally, GM would have a big giant air cleaner, sometimes with an oil bath. No, these little things, these are factory. That's the way they came. Apparently, the air was much cleaner in 57, so they didn't feel they need a lot of restriction. You know, it's hard to imagine how impressive this car was back in the day. Because most sports cars, your MGs, your Triumphs, 65 horsepower, 70, 80. A Jaguar, maybe 220 you might get. This is 270 horsepower. I mean, this was power-wise equal to any of the exotics, the Ferraris or anything of the period, and incredibly fast. And to me, incredibly good looking. I mean, you had roll-up windows and you had all the creature comforts and you had that marvelous new material fiberglass, which nobody really quite understood either, but a car made out of plastic. I don't know, Bob, what do you think? It took people a while to get used to that, but uh, as you can see, it certainly stood the test of time. They're just wonderful, wonderful cars to drive. We haven't done anything here. There's no headers or anything on it. I wanted to com keep it completely stock. The only thing we did was change the rear end ratio. What did we put in this, 354s? Um, it had 411s, which were a little whiny on the freeway. These are just the perfect car to go up the coast on Pacific Coast Highway or drive up in the hills with. I mean, and it's, it's really fast. It's a pretty lightweight car. I imagine it's under 3,000 pounds, probably 2,800 pounds. So with 270 horsepower and V8 torque, it, it moves along quite nicely. It's nothing to be embarrassed about, you know, when you go on a run. I mean, uh, Porsche didn't get that kind of horsepower until, what, 80s, something like that? So uh, pretty neat. Hey, let's put this down again so we can appreciate the lines of the car. Once you set it down, and then press each side. Come look at the interior of the car. That's what's pretty impressive, too. I love that speedometer, 140 mile an hour speedometer. That was, ooh, those are big numbers back in the day. The steering wheel, very European with the holes in it. Notice there's no radio, uh, I, I said no heater. The tachometer is kind of funny. It's right in the center of the dash, which is like the worst place. What is it? When, ah! You know, you're always doing that. So I, I probably would have put it up closer, but you know, a tachometer was a new thing in American cars back in the day, because American cars had big, lazy V8s. That nobody watched the revs. You just felt until it was time to shift, and you shifted, whereas this had a tachometer, which was unusual, uh, in, in especially in American cars of the period. You know, there's some cars that just, just don't hold up well. You know, to me, I like my 53 Hudson Hornet. You know, it sort of looks like like the, T, the Audi TT now, because it's, it's so rounded. And this one is one of those cars. There's nothing on this car that doesn't really need to be there. You know, it's got a proper trunk. I love the tail lights. I love the way the exhaust system exits through the bumpers, as you can see. That's really sort of Motorama show car looking stuff. When you saw a lot of the GM dream cars of the 50s, they always had the, uh, the exhaust exiting through here, you know, to sort of mimic uh, the World War II jet fighters and Korean jet fighters that were just coming into play. So that, that's, uh, that, that's pretty neat. I, I love this here. I mean, these bumpers really, you don't really want to bump them. They're not really bumpers, but they're really a, a, attractive. And it's just the right amount of chrome on this car. It's really, to me, one of the best looking Corvettes of all time. And as I said before, the first year Corvette got real serious about racing because, you know, one horsepower per cubic inch, that was unbelievable. That was a milestone. And a four-speed transmission instead of a three-speed. They went racing, they did Sebring, and they, they did a lot of racing with these. Duntoff was real serious about uh, taking the Corvette out and putting up against Europe's best. And they did quite well with it, you know. It wasn't until the Cobra came along that there was any sort of competitor 
uh, for the Corvette. And even when the Cobra came along, it didn't have the creature comforts that the Corvette did, you know, the roll-up windows and all that kind of stuff, easy to put up top and everything else. You can drive this like a modern car. You can throw it around a bit. And it, it's really quite fun to drive. And, and people just go nuts when they see it because it's such a startling, good-looking car, especially in this combination. I'm surprised only 65 were ordered in, this, in, in silver, but that's what it was. This was a late 1957 car. I don't know if it was the fastest car you could buy in America in 57, but boy, it was, it was close. It was close. This car in 1957 uh, was $4,600, which is a lot of money. That was, well, I remember my dad and I looked at a Cadillac in the mid to late 60s. That was also $4,600. So that was top of the line money. This is right up there in the Cadillac field. So, and once you start putting a few of these options on it, obviously it's, it's, it's gonna go up. But uh, your fuel filler door is right here. Correct gas cap. You know, Mike was a real sticker of that. Mike told me one time he went, took it to a car show, caught a guy trying to steal the gas cap. And hey, hey, put the, you know. But uh, very cool. Uh, your soft top, if it was here, would be under here. You press this button and this opens up like this and the soft top would come out of there. As you can see, there's no mechanism for a soft top. None of that's here because the original owner did not want the weight of that, which was, I don't know, you skip a couple of lunches, you could have had the top, I don't know. But anyway, but I thought this was very clever how this whole thing goes together. And it shuts like that. Uh, what else can we show you? Let's show you the trunk. It's got a actually, a proper trunk, you can actually carry stuff and take things in it. You know, this is something I've always admired about Corvette, is the fact that it's practical. And look at that, you got a full-size trunk. You can get a couple of bags in there. You know, try that in your Lamborghini, your NSX, or your P1 McLaren, there's no room at all. You know, that's the whole thing behind Corvette. You could use it as a real car. You can actually fit, honey, it's very practical. Look, we can take trips, you know, you can do all that, which you can't do, of course, in a lot of modern cars. But look at that, it's a pretty good sized trunk. And of course, your spare and everything is under here. Interesting fact about the Corvette, you know, it was 1952 and the Cold War and spies were everywhere and Chevrolet heard that Ford was gonna build something called a Thunderbird. And uh, they, they didn't, that was, they wanted to have something for the Motorama show. And of course, steel is very hard to work with. and. Uh, it takes a lot of planning. I thought, why don't we make something out of fiberglass? And so they came up with the Corvette for 53. And uh, that's why, because they heard Ford was coming out with a Thunderbird. And they realized, well, we can't tool up that quickly. Let's see if we can do something in fiberglass. Let's lay it out. And, and of course, you got all these curves and everything which would be hard to achieve with steel. And uh, the rest is history. So it, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. It's, it's kind of cool. This is why I always believe competition makes things better. You know, you think, what's the other guy's doing? You're so afraid you got to come up with something unbelievable to blow them out of the water. And, and they did it. They did it. I mean, the 53 Corvette was not a high performance car, but it was certainly caught everybody by surprise. You know, a two seater sports car. Wow, that's pretty cool. And then, of course, by 55, the 265 V8, and then, of course, the 283, 327, and, of course, where we are today. Uh, what else can we show you? I don't know, I think it's time to go for a ride. That's the stock exhaust system, that's the way they sound it. Pretty cool. Outside, I ran a little bit chilly, so I put on my official Corvette jacket. There you go. You can't drive a Corvette without a Corvette jacket. You know, this thing 
is fast even by modern standards, I can't imagine what it must have been like in 1957. I mean, you still had cars in the 30s on the streets in 57. I love that metallic rasp you hear through the exhaust. Chrysler had the big 392 Hemis, but those are in big 4, 4,500 pound cars. Not something as light as this. I mean, think about this 1957. 270 horsepower, two four barrel carburetors, no tricky Italian carburetors. You got to fine tune, nothing like that. Just dead on reliability with good old fashioned American horsepower. Okay, the chassis is not the most sophisticated thing. That would come later with the independent suspension and all that. But still, for a starter, it doesn't get much better than this. I just like the year 1957. It's my favorite year of the 50s because it really got excessive after 57. Remember Cadillac with the huge fins in 59? And the 58 Corvette was not as pretty as the 57, as I said before. Uh, to me, this is just pure styling. This was Duntoff trying to do his best to make a racing car. And I really think he succeeded. It's really an impressive, impressive piece of machinery. And it was made of plastic. I remember when I was a kid, people going, a plastic car, what's the world coming to? What are you gonna do when it crash? Is it all gonna melt? Is it gonna fall? I mean, people are so paranoid. You know, the shock of the new is always, it's always amazing to me. in the comments section. Do you think this is prettier than the new Corvettes? I mean, does this stand out more than any new car? I don't know, what do you think? I mean, to me, I think it's a really impressive design that holds up well today. So I'd love to hear your comments, let me know. You know, I mentioned earlier, there's nothing on this car that doesn't need to be there. Actually, there is, it's these scoops right here. They look great, but they're not functional. Although, to be fair, they built a number of race cars where they were functional and had a tube that ran from the scoop all the way back through the doors to the rear brake. But other than that, there's nothing on this car that doesn't need to be there. Remember those cool little uh, air cleaners I showed you? That was a one-year only option on 57. 58, they went to a big air cleaner like you had on most of the other GM stuff. So this is the, the first year of that, or the only year of that. You know, I was seven years old when this car was built, and I still remember seeing one in a magazine. I never saw one in person until years later. They just didn't have them in my neighborhood. But it always made an impression on me. In fact, the same impression it makes today. It's still an amazing car to drive, extremely powerful car. Uh, it's really, really impressive. This was a classic example of the best that America could do back in the day. And you know something? It really is true. So I hope you, little, hope you enjoyed this little trip down memory lane, as they say, and uh, I'm gonna go drive this thing tomorrow. See you later, next.